You know, you could go in the back room of Maxis, Kansas City, and one night you'd be sitting with Janis Joplin or Jim Morrison, and the next night you'd be sitting with Johnny Thunders, you know. Uh -huh. It was just, it was, and, and our Maria Callas. Uh -huh. You never knew what was going to happen in those uh -huh. days because the whole New York culture was all kind of mishmashed all together. It was, it, you know, one of my most fun times in my whole life because, um, you know, I I would go to parties at Gloria Vanderbilt's yeah. place, and then I would go to parties at John Vaccaro's place, and he would be pushing Candy Darling down two flights of stairs, and she'd be so stoned that it didn't even hurt her. And um, so in those days, it was New York was very experimental. New York was just really finding itself. Now, I mean, thanks to various restrictions and the way our culture has changed, you know, it's become more stru structured. But um, uh, in those days, it was just anything goes. It was so cool. Uh huh. And what, uh, uh, what, when you say experimental, what do you mean by experimental? Well, everybody was just beginning to discover that there were other and and enjoy that there were other lifestyles available and all on this little tiny island we live on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, baby Jane Holzer, who was so rich, would be having parties for people who were totally broke. Hollywood Lawn used to, when she'd go to these rich people's houses for dinner, yeah. because she was colorful and a drag queen and everything, the first thing she would do was she would go straight, she, where's the bathroom? Do you mind if I use the bathroom? And they'd tell her where it was and she'd go straight to the bathroom, open the medicine cabinet and steal all the pills. Uh, she didn't care which ones they were even. She just stole all the pills. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, you could, it, it used to be so funny when I would go with Andy Warhol to dinner at rich people's houses and Paul Morrissey, when and it would be like sit down dinners and Paul Morrissey when the hostess was out doing whatever they did would pick up the plates and look at the bottom of them to see if they were worth anything to <laughs> see if he, <laughs> if he should steal them or not. And uh, because, I mean, they were living dangerously. They were living with junkies and drag queens and, you know, really, really crazy people. Uh -huh. But at the same time, what was happening, which is probably more to the point, is some great experimental music was coming out of this. Mm -hmm. Because we had to do something. Mm -hmm. And music was pretty much all that uh, we could think of, and movies. And um, so that's where then television, the Ramones, Blondie, all those people grew out of that culture because um, like uh, Blondie had, for example, uh, an apartment on the Bowery, the whole band. When I say Blondie, I don't mean Debbie Harry, I mean the, all of them because I know she hates to be referred to as Blondie, but but it was the whole band then. They were all living in this apartment on the Bowery. And I was up photographing them and asked if I could use the bathroom. And uh, she said, she took me in to show me the bathroom and there was this pipe coming out of the wall. And she said, don't get frightened if a rat comes out of that pipe, because they do it all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but then in that case, I'll be very quick. Uh -huh. But uh, we lived very poor. We had no money. Hollywood Lawn was making her clothes. Oh, incidentally, look at all this shiny stuff. I found it in the garbage last night. Mm -hmm. It's quite nice. I can't, I'll make something out of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, but you still do that in New York. That was always, uh, we knew that Thursdays was garbage day on the Upper East Side. 
So we would all get on the subway and go the up to the Upper East Side where these rich people who had no concept of what was worth anything or not and didn't care would just put it all out for the garbage people. And of course we didn't just pick it all up and take it home. So we got all kinds of stuff that way, you know, mm -hmm. chairs and you know, ironing boards, you know, stuff we couldn't afford to get. We couldn't yeah. e even afford to get anything. And so, uh, you, so you go for garbage day. But so it's a habit I can't um, <laughs> give up because last I night when I left, Jake, Jake performed at Arlene's Grocery last night. And when I walked out, there was all this satin there in the garbage can. And it's even still got the tags on it. So I thought, well, I can do something with that. I'll uh -huh. turn that into um, clothes for somebody, maybe not me, but for somebody. So I actually just learned this morning something that I had forgotten. Uh, I was on the phone with Roberta Bailey and we were talking about uh, this Iggy movie and stuff. And so we were talking about CBGBs. And um, I said the first person to play CBGBs was Patti Smith. And she said, absolutely not. She said the first person to play CBGB's was before it was even called CBGB's. It was called Hillies on the Bowery. Mm -hmm. And it was Jane County. Really? Who was the very first act in really? the, that building, which wasn't even CBGB's then. And I remember I went to the gig, but I had forgotten it completely. You forget things, you know, uh -huh. you just... Um, as the years go on, right. I, you know, what's that commercial on TV? I don't even know my grandson's name. Uh -huh. Well, neither do I. But um, do you have one? No, no, <laughs> I've, I've got Jake, and uh -huh. so I will have one. He um, he coined a phrase that was just two weeks ago quoted on VH1, which I found very peculiar. You know, you say something. And then all of a sudden it's on TV. And he said, I was a straight guy who liked straight guys. And he's a gay guy who likes girls. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they quoted it on VH1. I thought, well, good, here we go. We're still making history. <laughs> but um, but at any rate, uh, can you t talk a bit, a bit about Max's? What was, uh, what was Max's like? OK. Um, Max's is, was pretty much all the things that you um, have heard are true. Um, first of all, out front were the artists at the bar all mm -hmm. getting drunk because they could. Yeah. Because they didn't have to pay for anything. I see. And then they just sling a painting or a sculpture or something at Mickey Ruskin every once in a while to sort of sort of pay their bill. Mickey didn't really seem to mind. And then in the middle were all the business people who just wanted to see all the artists at the front and then all the crazy people in the back room. Uh -huh. Now the back room was quite small and um, lit with red lights. And um, to go in the back room, the first thing you would, first of all, you had to go down a little hallway past the bathrooms and the kitchens right, and stuff. Yeah. And so then there was this little doorway into the back room and always sitting at the entrance to the back room was this lady named Dorothy Dean. Mm -hmm. and that was her table right there at the entrance. And she was a cantankerous old cuss. And if someone came tentatively and stopped at the door, the first thing they would hear was, who the hell do you think you are? And they'd run, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But if they didn't run, and then, then she'd be fine and everyone else would be fine. And in the back room then, the usual things, all, everything you've heard, you'd walk by the round table and Bridget Polk always had a hypodermic needle and as you walked by, she would just stab it right into your butt. Mm. And you didn't even know what you were getting. 
Sometimes it was up, sometimes it was down. Most of the time it was up, but because that was her favorite. But she'd just sit there. That was her sport. As you walk by, she'd just stab you. And uh, then otherwise, once again, it was kind of what I was saying. You don't know who you were going to get in there. You get Nico sitting with Peter O'Toole. You get Danny Fields sitting with Jim Morrison. You know, it was just... The back room was just a total mishmash of alternative lifestyles, you know. And um, mm -hmm. once again, Mickey Raskin never, never, ever gave anyone a bill. I see. You know, heaven knows. I mean, I didn't spend a lot of money then because I didn't have a lot of money. So I was in the habit of not... Uh, ordering stuff I couldn't afford, but as it turns out, I could have because he never, ever, ever gave me a bill or anyone else that I'm aware of. And um, you just sat there and met all kinds of different people. Friend Leibowitz saying, oh, I really want to be a writer someday. You know, Lisa Robinson cruising the whole room. Uh, Iggy, of course, there all the time, whenever he was in town. Lou Reed there constantly. And um, it was just, it was like a little calf. It wasn't anything big. It was little banquettes and the red lights, which made you look great, because red lights always make you look great. And so you'd sit there and you'd get your one glass of wine and you'd sip it for the whole night and you'd <laughs> flirt. And then, at closing time, suddenly the red lights would go off and the white lights would come on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Tammy Wynette would come on the jukebox singing, Sometimes it's hard to be a woman. You know, and you'd know you, that was it. It was closing time. And suddenly we were all looking at each other in white lights. And... We don't look so good in white lights, even back then when I was 19 years old. So it was truly an alternate lifestyle. By alternate lifestyle, oh, yeah. you I mean, I mean and what? There, there would be, I mean, you, of course, I'm sure you know about Andrea Feldman standing on the table and taking off all her clothes and screaming at showtime and uh, doing, um, you know, weird sort of sexual acts to herself in front of everyone. Taylor Mead taking off all his clothes, which is not exactly even in those days uh -huh. when he was only a hundred years old, was not especially attractive. And, um, and Mickey Ruskin just let that all happen. He would occasionally come back and look into the back room to make sure no one was dead. And then he'd just smile and walk out again. And there'd be Andrea standing naked on a table, screaming and carrying on. And, um, uh -huh. and Bridget Polk sticking people with drugs. What about the music? Did you uh, get interested in the music at that time? Well, what got me into the music is first, uh, I, see, I've been a photographer for my high school yearbook and stuff like that. So I had a camera. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm a Southern boy, and so I have, I still actually, believe it or not, have kind of a shy streak. And so it was my way of meeting people to have the camera. Mm -hmm. So, and in those days, there were the great drag queens. For example? Um, on Christopher Street, these drag queens would... They would buy wigs on 14th Street, and they would get like eight wigs and sew them all together. So it was like huge hair. <laughs> and um, platform shoes, which would clonk down Christopher Street. They would put on like seven pairs of false eyelashes, so their eyelids were like awnings. You could actually hear them when they blinked. <laughs> and um, so I began photographing them. Mm -hmm. And uh, not because I had any idea that it was going to be any kind of a career for me, but, cu but because I found them astounding and I wanted to get to know them. And that's how I got to know Jackie Curtis. And Jackie Curtis then said, you know, she invited me to Max's Kansas City and 
that was right at the time when um, Lou Reed had just been temporarily released from an insane asylum. And um, Mickey Ruskin had said, well, you can come and play upstairs. And it wasn't even meant to be, the intention was never meant to have a music room uh -huh. there. This was basically Mickey Ruskin's idea of how to give Lou something to do. Because uh -huh. sometimes there would only be like four or five people in uh, in the audience, you know. Uh, and so Lou was playing up there, and so I would go up, and so then it was just a natural extension from my drag queen stuff that I started photographing Lou Reed. And he played the whole summer. This was, I think, 1968. Uh-huh. And in fact, those tapes have now been re-released. They just came out yesterday mm -hmm. or the day before. Oh, really? And because um, Bridget would always be there taping. She taped everything. And um, then uh, Lou's parents locked him up again for a while. And suddenly the tapes were a hit. And no one had pictures of him but me. And so unintentionally, suddenly, I was a rock and roll photographer. <laughs> and, uh, and they were good pictures. Um, uh, and they're included in this new CD that just came out. And um, so then I suddenly was getting calls to photograph bands and so, uh, next thing I knew I was at Madison Square Garden down in the pit you know down front yeah. photographing all kinds of bands up there you know and uh, you know the Rolling Stones and the Who and all that kind of stuff and so I became a rock and roll photographer by accident. Um, let me ask you um, what what do you think the underlying cultural climate was at that time that uh, that sort of um, created this sort of alternative lifestyle or underground movement or whatever you want to call it. What was the what was the cultural climate like? Drugs. Drugs. Yeah. Uh, can it be? Or just sticking a needle in you as you walked by the tape. Uh huh. No, I I hate to sound that blunt, but. In those days, it was really weird, and I would not tell young people to live the kind of life that I somehow miraculously survived. But if Bridget stuck a needle in me, I didn't mind, and I didn't know whether I was going to go up or down. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone came up to me and said, open your mouth, I'd just go, ah, and they'd stick a pill in it. Uh -huh. And it could be LSD or it could be speed or, and so what we did was then that just made us totally erratic, all of us. And we're talking about the rich people and the poor people and the in-betweens and that's what actually created that rock and roll scene in my opinion uh -huh. is we didn't know what else to do because we were so high all the time that we just, you know, I didn't play the music, I took pictures of it, and all these other people played the music. I mean, once Jane was, because Jane and I were roommates in those days, and Jane was uh, getting ready to go out, and I heard her in the bathroom, and it was like, bang, 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 bang. I said, Jane, hmm. what? You're going to give yourself a black eye. What are you doing? She said, oh, oh, I, I took some Percodan. Was I hitting myself too hard? And we just, we just, you didn't, from minute to minute, you didn't know whether you were going to be up or down. And there were a lot of casualties, but not as many as you would think. And, um, because it's funny, when I went to the Jackie Curtis opening and I was with Tommy, he looked around and he said, all these people are still alive? And I said, yes, believe it or not, a lot of us managed to live through it. Some of us didn't, but 
Yeah, if someone just said to me in those days, open your mouth, I would just open it, and in would go some kind of pill. And uh, then I'd just wait to see what happened. What, what was the, what was... Wh and I, Debbie what? Harry will tell you this, too. She was the same way. She would mm -hmm. just be up and down, and she didn't care. And if you now think back on her band, how it was created, and how she looked, mm -hmm. and how her music sounded, you, you can actually see that. It was all over the place, but that was what made it fabulous and fun, is, you know, she just drew from everything, depending on whatever record was on. Suddenly she'd be the Shangri-Las, and then she'd be Tina Turner, and she just, you know, she would just pull from everywhere, and from all that, she created Debbie Harry, you know, and we all kind of did that. I did the same thing with my photography, you know. I just, uh, I didn't really, you know, I wasn't Richard Avedon. Uh, I just was taking pictures of crazy people, but it seemed to work out for me, you know, because I loved the crazy people. What was the reason for all those drugs? Well, um, you know, the reason was uh, in the 1960s, um, Life magazine put out an article about Timothy Leary and LSD and, and love-ins and things, and so we all kind of thought, that's something to do, because we all were kind of bored, because basically the music we had then was um, Fabian and Frankie Avalon and stuff like that. Uh, the lifestyle we had was programmed to put us right where we belonged, which meant get married, have two and a half children and a Cocker Spaniel, and get a house very close to your family. And that's it, you're done. And so we, instead we went to San Francisco. And so some of us did become drug addicts. Fortunately, I didn't, but uh, a lot of people did, unfortunately. But um, what it was, it was just something, it was just, we had to break free all of a sudden, we had to just break out and the music came out of that as well obviously with um, Janis Joplin and Jefferson Airplane and bands and you know Jim Morrison bless his heart you know it just all just sprung out of everybody being just kind of a little out of control for a, sort of a long time you know I remember being at a Big Brother and the Holding Company concert at the Straight Theater on Haight Street. And um, everyone was on acid. And um, suddenly, like will happen on acid, someone started saying, the cops are out front. They're all waiting for us. They backed up the, the cars to just, when we go out the door, we're, we're going to be taken straight to jail for what? You don't know because you're on acid, so you kind of panic and run. And so I ran out of the straight theater and ran down Haight Street and got to Van Ness, where there's a there. In those days, there was a donut shop right on the corner, and I was still like panicking and running, and I fell right across the hood of a police car. And the policemen were in the car eating their donuts. And they just kind of looked at me like, oh, God. And I just got off the car hood and stumbled on home. But it was, it was a weird time, and it should not be repeated. But at that time, I, I do not regret that I lived through it. But drugs created all that rock and roll because... Uh, if you listen to it, if you listen to Blue Cheer and Cream and stuff, they were just so completely out of control. They couldn't play anything. It was, it was punk, but we didn't know that word then. 
and uh, you know they were just hit, just hitting their guitars. Jimi Hendrix was setting his guitar on fire. I mean, everybody was like really crazy, and that's really my only explanation for it. It's because we were all stoned all the time for a, a too long of a time, and but that's over now. When we, when I settled in New York and got involved with Andy Warhol and the factory and everything, I also got involved in underground theater, and which was very creative then and, and to my mind very entertaining. And so Jackie Curtis was writing a lot of plays, Charles Ludlam, people like that. And there was always music involved in them because, you know, they were kind of out of control plays. So if you broke into a weird song, at least the audience could kind of be entertained. Uh, so Jane got into a show with Jackie Curtis that she had written called Femme Fatale. And uh, there were songs in it. And Jane thought, and Jane at that time was Wayne. And Jane thought, wait a minute, this, this is fun, I can do that. And uh, Jackie never actually was too happy with what happened with Jane because of course Jane went on to do what Jackie really would have liked to have gone on to do. Jane began writing her own songs, writing her own plays. She wrote a play called World Birth of a Nation, which ran for for off off Broadway. It was really good. It ran for about nine months, and um, then she started performing. And she, first, she formed a band called Queen Elizabeth, and bit by bit, she became more and more of a woman, mm -hmm. till she realized she was more comfortable performing as a woman than as a half woman, you know, mm -hmm. and so then she just went ahead and became a woman. And then, see, the thing about Jane County is she, she knows her rock and roll history. She was involved in the British Invasion records, you know, mm -hmm. she collected them all. She learned it all. She learned what, how to play and everything and how songs should Perform. sound yeah. uh, and not also it was accidental for her too she wasn't planning to become a rock star she just that's what you know you put on the record and then you stand there and you pretend you're playing guitar and stuff you everybody does that and um, but she really learned it you know when people talk to me young kids and they think I know everything about rock and roll. I can't tell you how many times I say, no, ask Jane, because she knows everything about rock and roll, because she does. And um, so she took all that knowledge she had accidentally gleaned, and it, to my mind, turned it into very humorous, satiric, but good rock and roll songs. I mean, if you don't want to fuck me, baby, 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 fuck off. It's one of the greatest rock and roll songs I've ever heard in my whole life, you know. And just because it says fuck in it, you know, so what? You know, it's right. really, really good. And, um, and it's very bluesy and it's very cool. And um, so it just all kind of grew out of, well, she was a southern southern boy in Georgia listening to records. I was a southern boy in Kentucky listening to records. And um, there were people on the radio and TV saying rock and roll is a very bad influence. And those people were right. You uh, actually had a band yourself, didn't you? Didn't you manage a band called, uh, uh, called um, Levi and the Rockettes? Yes, I mean, I also managed uh, the Heartbreakers. You did? Yes. When was that? Um, the Heartbreakers I managed from 1976 till uh, 19, 
79. All, mostly in Europe is where we were then. We were touring Europe. And they were not easy. As you well know, they were junkies. And so the, the thing I'm proud of is I got them on and off stage. And, and we did some great rock and roll. I loved that. And during the course of that, then I met uh, Levi. Uh -huh. And um, he was this goofy little East London, you know, boy. And he wanted to have a band. So I said to him what I say to, what I've said to Jake and Tommy and the new people I'm working with is if you want to have a band, have a band, you know, just let's do it. Mm -hmm. So we just created Levi and the Rock Hats. And that lasted for years. It never made us much money, but we toured the whole world and, um, and in my opinion, made some really good music, but, uh -huh, um, uh -huh. you know, it never kicked off properly so that they became rich, but, mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Once again, what I said is, because I always do this when I work with people, I, I try to tell them don't take drugs. I can't order them to, but I can advise them to. And now Jake, who I just went to see last night, my own little boy, uh, he's, you know, he gets out of control and he gets crazy, but he doesn't take drugs. Uh -huh. and, um, mm -hmm. and he put on a very good show last night. Mm -hmm. So if I can do anything in that direction that actually works, I'm very happy. I see. So I consider all these boys, the Rockettes, the Star Spangles, Jake's band, they're all like my children. They're my, um, uh -huh. they're my offspring. Your offspring, yeah. Yes. Tell me about, uh, tell me about the, the Heartbreakers and Johnny Thunders in particular. Uh, what, what was sort of your impression of the music, the the personalities, the... Uh... Well, of course I met him when he was uh, in the New York Dolls. Thunders? Yeah. And um, I was impressed then. Mm -hmm. uh, see, it's, it's like my... The way I work in rock and roll is... I'm not looking for Eric Clapton. In fact, that would bore me to tears. Uh -huh. I'm looking for someone who is a little out of control uh -huh. and just banging on their guitar or their drums because there's something happening somewhere in their brain or their heart that they just gotta get out. You know, uh -huh. I, I'm not ever I've never ever been interested in those technical uh -huh. uh, musicians, and um, that was Johnny. Johnny couldn't play really; he was just banging away on that guitar. He couldn't sing. He looked weird, and yet I was totally in love with him from the very first time I met him. And um, then he came up to me, and he after the dolls broke up and he'd formed the heartbreakers and he asked me he said would you like to manage us and i said absolutely yes i would definitely will do it and i called tony zanetta because tony and I, I worked together with uh david bowie and with iggy and Tony is a very leveling influence, and he's very intelligent, but he's still he's not judgmental, he's really cool. And so I said, Tony, I've, I've decided to manage Johnny Thunders. And Tony said, as, and I said, do you want to join me in this uh -huh. project? And Tony said, are you crazy? crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you have lost your mind now. And uh, so he wouldn't do it. Uh -huh. And so I still thought, well, yeah, I guess I'm crazy and I've lost my mind, but I'm going to do it. And so we then Malcolm McLaren called us, called me, and he said, uh, we're going to, I have this band called the Sex Pistols. 
uh -huh. and we're going to do a tour. And I would like the Heartbreakers to come and be on the tour. Uh huh. So I called Johnny Thunders and I said, have you ever heard of the Sex Pistols? And he said, yeah, I've heard something, you know, just, you know, just little English twits, you know. And I said, well, they want us to come and be on a tour with them. And Johnny said, good, let's go to England. Uh -huh. We'll go. Because, you know, sometimes as fun as it was to play Max's Kansas City and CBGB's, you just can't do that forever. Right. Uh, you know, it's like Sophie Tucker in Las Vegas, you know, eventually you got to move on. And so we went and we got there. We had no idea what we were getting into. We went to rehearsals at the Rainbow in London and these totally juvenile little kids came toddling down the aisle and said, hi, we're the Clash. <laughs> and I thought, oh God, this is so doomed. So doomed. And um, so the bill on the Anarchy Tour was, Sex Pistols were headlining, of course, then the Heartbreakers, then the Damned, then the Clash. Uh -huh. And um, then all the scandal broke out because the Sex Pistols said bollocks on TV. Bollocks? They said bollocks on Tea Time TV on, in London. Bollocks. <laughs> and it made headlines. Every newspaper went crazy, you know, about them. You know, how horrible they were. So a whole lot of the shows were canceled. Uh-huh. So... But uh, let me ask you, uh, you said something about what made you fall in love with him. What made you fall in love with Johnny? Was his total innocence. Innocence? Yeah, he didn't believe in himself at all. He didn't think that he was anything at all. And yet, he was on stage and I was in the audience, and he was. He was, and, I, and not just me, Everybody, you know, who was in the audience with me at that time thought he was wonderful. We didn't care. I mean, he couldn't carry a tune at that time at all. And his guitar playing was basically just banging on the guitar. But you just looked at him and you thought, that's our boy. You uh. know, he's, he's real and true, you know. He's not standing up there doing these things, you know. He was just going clang, clang on the guitar. And that's what made everyone fall in love with him. I, Lisa Robinson, Larissa Johnson Beck, all, Sarinda Fox, all the people who were in the audience in those days just all loved him, that he just existed. We, we didn't require that he played perfect music. I mean, if we want perfect music, we can go get a Chet Atkins album, you know? And um, so, yeah, we loved his, just that he was up there and just banging away and had the nerve to do it. But here, so let me, let me finish the story about the Anarchy Tour. So, of course, by this time, he was already a famous junkie. And also, in, their, in the eyes of the Sex Pistols in the Clash, he was an older person. What he, he really wasn't, because he had started out in the business very young. Mm -hmm. So he was almost their same age, but he seemed older because he had more of a history. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so you could tell they were kind of thinking, oh God, what's this old guy doing here? And the first gig that actually got booked and got on was at Leeds Polytechnic. And the clash, of course, in those days were totally horrible, but that, see, I don't mind totally horrible. I love totally horrible. You know, one of them didn't even have a whole guitar. It was all broken in half. 
and yeah, yeah. he was just playing what was left of it. And um, uh, then Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers took the stage. And I could see from all, cause it also, and it was part of the tradition of the punks to hate anyone who had gone before. Uh -huh. They were supposed to hate Led Zeppelin and The Who and all those people. And who knows why, because they wouldn't have existed if there hadn't been for Led Zeppelin and The Who, especially The Who. And um, so Johnny got up on stage and they're kind of standing there with those smug little faces and he just did his number. He banged his guitar, he did his hair, and he looked at the audience and he said, oh, how does it begin this song? You didn't love me because I couldn't dance. Well, now, and then bang, do you love me? At and I looked at Johnny Thunders, I mean, at Johnny Rotten and at um, uh, the other Sex Pistols, Paul Cook and everything, and they were just standing there with their mouths open because they were seeing real rock and roll because you can be rebels, which is great, but eventually uh, you have to actually make the Do music. It. Yeah. You know, and there it was happening on stage in front of them. And from that moment, they worshipped Johnny Thunders. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, 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 he was lovable because he was so innocent looking, or he, he felt... He, no, oh, he, he wasn't was... innocent looking. He, I mean, he was innocent looking, but he was innocent, period. He was a junkie. Uh, he tried to be a rebel, but he just didn't do it very well. He was just really innocent. He just really wanted to be loved. You just wanted to put your arms around him. And he wanted you to put your arms around him and just hold him and make him safe. You couldn't. You could do it for a couple of minutes, hold him and make him safe. But um, then, of course, he'd go out and score some heroin and be falling down in the street and stuff like that. But he wasn't, there was not a mean portion of him at all. He was totally loving and generous. And he just didn't know quite how to do it properly, you know. And a lot of people are like that. Sid Vicious was another one. Mm -hmm. You know, he just, all he wanted was for somebody to just say, it's okay, Sid, you're in no danger. But you could say that, but he wouldn't, it wouldn't take, then he'd go off and be in trouble again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you've had, uh, you know, uh, a very close and long-lasting relationship with uh, Jane County. Mm -hmm. what's, what is, what's so important and wonderful about Jane County that, uh, that you've, that has maintained such a long relationship? Well, I mean, it's, um, me and Jane, uh, first of all, I respect her musical ability and her musical knowledge and her humor. Uh -huh. uh, but, I mean, then it just, for me and Jane, it gets down to what it is for Ozzy and Harriet. I mean, we are just, we've been together so long uh -huh. that that's it, you know, we're just together. That's. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, we fight, sometimes we don't speak, stuff like that, but, um, you know, she had been in New York for one week when I had been in New York for one week, and we met on Christopher Street, both cruising the same boy, who turned us both down, <laughs> and uh. so we were left staring at each other, and so she said, Hi, I'm from Georgia. I've been here for a week. I said, I'm from Kentucky. I've been here for a week. And uh, we have been... So that... Basically, I admire her musicianship. I admire what she's done with her life because God knows it's against all odds what she's done, you know. Um, 
to, I mean, I don't know how many albums she's got out now, you know, like 12, 13, mm -hmm. 14 albums. Um, some great music, some brilliant performances. But between me and Jane, what it comes down to is really just Laverne and Shirley. We're just, mm -hmm. you know, we're just lifelong friends and that's mm -hmm. all it comes down to. You know, I know everything wrong with her. She knows everything wrong with me. Did. Um, well, uh, tell me about, you know, uh, apparently she was connected with Stonewall or she had something to do with the Stonewall Wall Rebellion and um, what about all that? Is that is that difficult? Was that difficult? Well, uh, Jane and I, see, in those days, of course, what no days? one... What, what then, when? Uh, what was it, 1968, 69? 69 when the riot happened. Um, we didn't have any money, mm -hmm. so uh, occasionally we would go to the Stonewall and get one drink and sit and sip it all night, you know, and um, of course those were the days of the great drag queens that I've described mm -hmm. to you with all the millions of wigs and everything. And we would watch them vogue. This is before Madonna stole it all. They were voguing in those days, dear. And um, so that night, Jane and I didn't have any money. So then if you don't have any money, what you do in those days is go sit on a stoop on Christopher Street and hope that someone who did have some money would come and pick you up. Uh -huh and at least maybe feed you or something, and then obviously then proceed from there. And uh, so we were sitting on Christopher Street when we heard clop, 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 clop of the platform shoes. And out came this drag queen named Twiggy. And um, she screamed, they're raiding the stone wall, they're raiding the stone wall. And we had just been in the raid at a bar called The Sewer the night before. Uh -huh. And what they would do in those days when they raided gay bars was they'd let all the boys go and all the girls go. But they'd take down your name and so you'd say, oh, you know, my name's Rod Stewart, you know, but uh, they'd let you go. But the drag queens, they would put behind the bar because, and I think it's still the law, it's against the law to dress in drag except on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> the theory being that you can then go and rob a bank as if Twiggy could, with all those eyelashes could go in and rob a bank. She couldn't even find the bank. But um, they would always put the drag queens behind the bar and take them to jail. Then they'd let them out, you know, but it was an annoyance. So we'd been in the, the raid at the sewer the very night before. So they did the same thing at the Stonewall. They were letting everyone out except the drag queens who they put behind the bar. And the drag queens just finally had had enough. And also we get back to drugs again they were all speeding out of their mind yeah and so they just started throwing bottles at the cops and everything and the cops didn't know what to do because it's the old thing everyone knew that they were men but they were dressed as women so you can't really hit them so the cops got confused, uh -huh. and so the drag queens escaped, uh -huh. and that's how the riots began. And so yes, Jane and I were both involved in those riots for the whole time it went on. I remember the very first one, the very first night, Jane actually standing on the hood of a police car, jumping up and down with the police inside the car. And once again, they were just looking at her and thinking, I don't know if that's a man or a woman, and so I don't know whether to hit him or not. You know, so uh -huh, uh -huh. the drag queens kind of got away with it in those days in that respect, which they should, you know, don't hit anybody as far as I'm concerned. 
but those were the riots have been blown a bit out of proportion from what they were. They were actually not that dangerous. They, um, I've never felt in danger during it. But um, there was a lot of uh, confusion and a lot of running around and sometimes ducking down uh, stoops and, and hiding down the stairways and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But that was almost like hide and seek. That was fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know of anyone who actually got hurt in those mm -hmm. riots. But they did change the whole uh, face of um, gay society. Now, um, you know, as a musician, uh, like someone like Jane, how do you, how do you survive? How do you, how do you make a living unless you are, uh, I, unless you are a, a superstar or a mega star? How do you survive as a musician? No, it like it Jane? is totally, totally dangerous in that respect. Uh, and I've said that to because you know I still work with young musicians starting out and that's one of the first things I say to them is you know it's not all sex drugs and rock and roll some of it is starvation and um, uh -huh. privation and when I had the heartbreakers in London we had a rule that each heartbreaker could have one treat a day. Mm -hmm. And Jerry Nolan would always get a Granny Smith apple. Johnny Thunders would get a little tube of Smarties. Uh -huh. And that's what they got. They got one treat a day. And I was lucky to be able to afford that for them. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you're just so broke. So it's got to be because that's what you want to do. Love it. Uh, just love it. Yeah, because if you're going into it to get laid and get high, that's fair enough, you know, but that don't always come true. And if you're going in it to make the music, then you make the music and sometimes you're in a hostel where you're all in the same room uh -huh. in bunk beds, mm -hmm. you know, and you're lucky to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, then other times, then there's money and things are fine. And, but then almost immediately, then there's no money again. Mm -hmm. And it's just a total roller coaster ride until you become, you know, the Rolling Stones or the Beatles and um, everyone doesn't become them. And in truth, who would want to become them? Yeah. You know, they're, uh, for, t take the Rolling Stones, there's not one single one of them who seems to be at the least bit contented or happy with their lives. Yeah. Now, uh, now tell me, um, you've been involved with music, you know, the, the music world, the, 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 the underground world, the, uh, the alternative lifestyle world. Uh, yeah. Do you have any regrets? Absolutely none. I've been thinking about that because right now I'm really broke. I'm, um, you know, I've got things on the horizon and things that didn't happen, and that's what how it is. But um, this is kind of a dumb parallel, but I will tell you just the same. My friends in high school who followed the rules, uh -huh. who got married and had two and a half kids and all that kind of stuff, uh -huh. and got a job with Standard Oil, uh, back in those days, all of a sudden, everything crashed and burned. I don't know if you remember the Great Recession of oh, the, yeah. those days. And I went back to my 10-year high school reunion And, you know, I looked pretty good. You know, I was living in Hollywood. I was in a black Lurex tuxedo with those kind of fins, those David Bowie fins on the shoulders. And they said, oh, wow, your life is so wonderful. And, of course, my life wasn't wonderful at all. I never knew where the next dollar was coming from. But I learned from them then that neither did they. And they had 
two and a half kids and a cocker spaniel to feed. And so you just never know in life. And so with the rock and rollers, you know, I've warned the young kids from the beginning, it's not easy. There's no guarantee uh -huh. you're gonna um, you're gonna succeed. Certainly not to the extent that the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and people like that have succeeded. But even you know, to make a decent, solid living, it's just not that kind of a job. You know, so if you want to do it, you got to do it for the music. And. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny, uh, Tommy and I got on the phone the other night and we were trying because of this thing coming up on August 14th where there's like two members of one band, one member of another band, you know, because all the rest of them are dead. Mm -hmm. And I said, Tommy, of all the great bands, can you think of a band from the great days of rock and roll that they're all still alive. And he said, the kinks. And that was when Jane was still talking to me. And so I was talking to Jane and I, I told her the story and she said, oh no, Rick Avery died two years ago. <laughs> so yeah. it's a high risk occupation. And you don't make as, nearly as much money as people think you make. You know, it's like writers, uh, filmmakers, creative people just just don't make as much money as other people think they're making. They're not yeah. because it's erratic. You don't yeah. know when it's coming and when it's not coming. Right. And you got to learn to deal with that. And if you choose that, then um, then that's what you're chosen, and then that's what you have to do. You know so, and. You know, as as I've told you, I think already, I've, there's been many a time when I've gone out and gotten a job, mm -hmm. because especially when I had a band that had to be fed. Mm -hmm. You go out and you go to work, but um, that's to keep the music going. So, no regrets. Absolutely no regrets. I wouldn't want to be even if I did get a stable job at IBM or something like that and a nice three-bedroom suburban house, oh, that would be regrets for me. You know, I'm glad those people are happy. I hope they're happy, but uh, I would just be bouncing off the walls. No, I'm happy here in my cluttered little room uh, with, you know, sometimes some money, sometimes no money, but like last night, I went to see my son on stage at, at Arlene's Grocery, and he was bouncing around and doing splits and stuff. And I thought, oh my God, this is what I'm here for. This is, this is what gives me my energy to go on. And, um, you know, and there were people, of course, who came up to me in Arlene's Grocery and said, are you really Lee Black Childers? And I said, last time I looked at my passport, yes, that's still me. Because there are so many people who just assume I'm so long dead. But I'm not yet. But uh, I wouldn't change anything, not a moment. The drag queens, San Francisco, Timothy Leary, Bill Graham, um, you know, all the ups and downs, the weird places I've sometimes had to live, the weird people I've occasionally had to live with, all of it have just made my life so wonderful. And um, so I didn't know it when I was a child, but I know it now. I got what I wished for. <laughs>